ahead and get started. Um, welcome to the Tech Forum call, um, TA State Climate and Energy Tech Forum call on energy efficiency resource standards. Um, for the speakers and facilitators to unmute your individual lines, please, please hit pound six. And um, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so I want to um, first thank all the speakers um, today for agreeing to talk on this subject. We're going to um, cover energy efficiency resource standards on the state level, and we're going to talk a little bit about what's going on at the federal level as well. Um, we have Jeff Brown from the EPA State Climate and Energy Program, and we also have Mike Sherman from the Massachusetts Department of Energy Resources. Um, we hope to have David Baker from the Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic Development. Um, there were some questions earlier today about whether or not he'd be able to join, so we will hope that he calls in as the call progresses. So, um, for those of you who um, don't, um, who haven't downloaded the background material for presentation, you can go to www.epatechforum.org and you can find all the, um, the agenda and resources and background information there. So, um, with that, I am going to Margaret. Um, are you are you there? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, Catherine. Are we both on? Okay, great. Um, so we've got Catherine Morris and Margaret Pinard from the Keystone Center, and they're going to be helping um, with facilitation and with some of the um, the webinar um, software. So, um, and I think the one thing we want to point out to the participants is that while the speakers are talking, if you have questions, you can use the Q and A. On or um, a task bar, everybody can see the task bar on the left right hand side of your screen. And if that task bar is getting in the way, you can minimize it by using the um, arrow, the double arrow at the on the top tab of that task bar to, to get that out of the way. Um, but we will try to stop in between speakers to give you a chance to ask a couple of clarifying questions and then we have saved a fair amount of time at the end for us to again Q&A, uh, but you have two options for doing that. You can, we'll give you some reminders about how to unmute your phone, or you can start typing um, your your questions in and ask them to us, and we'll ask them for you. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it back to you and Jeff. Okay, great. Um, so Jeff, uh, do we have you there on the line? Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Great. great. Um, so um, Margaret, if you want, do we have... Um, I'm having some issues with my computer. Do we have just presentation up? Sure. Give me one second. I'm right there. Okay. And while Margaret's doing that, I just want to announce really quickly um, that next month's tech forum call will be on EPA's mandatory reporting rules for greenhouse gases. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about um, what EPA has developed, um, the rule itself, and we're going to talk about how um, EPA and states can share data and um, work together in the development of the um, data system. So that will probably be um, the last week of February, and we'll send out to save the date in the next week or two on that. So um, if we're all ready to go, then I will hand it over to Jeff Brown. Okay, thanks, Julia. Um, my name is Jeff Brown, and I'm with EPA's State Climate and Energy Program, and I'm going to be providing an overview of energy efficiency resource standards at the state and the federal level. Next slide. I'm going to be starting with a high-level summary of energy efficiency resource standards. Um, basically, ERS is an establish establishes a requirement for utilities and or other program administrators to meet annual and cumulative energy savings targets through a portfolio of energy efficiency programs. 23 states have an ERS as of the end of 2009. And these ERSs are important drivers of rate payer investment in energy efficiency programs and energy savings. The design and implementation details of these energy efficiency resource standards vary by state. 
And at the federal level, there is a renewable electricity standard with an energy efficiency component that is in the House passed and the Senate Energy Committee passed the climate energy bills where the utilities are allowed to use energy efficiency savings to meet a portion of the renewable electricity standard. And so that's basically what we're going to cover today, and we'll go into more detail now. So next slide. Um, I already went through a few of these things, but NEOS basically establishes a requirement for utilities to meet energy saving targets through a portfolio of efficiency programs, and we have 23 right now. And many states have adopted these in the last three years. Um, the vast majority of these ERSs are standalone energy efficiency resource standards, although there are a few states like North Carolina and Nevada that have combined their efficiency and renewable standards together um, and where efficiency is eligible to meet a component or a, um, a portion of the renewable standard. Um, most people consider energy efficiency resource standards complementary to other state level efficiency policies like minimum building energy codes or plant standards or low-income weatherization programs. But it's worth considering that, uh, at least in the short term, it's drawing from the same pool of energy efficiency potential. In some cases, the coordination across the state on efficiency policy is important. And ratepayer-funded energy efficiency programs uh, developed to meet ER targets in most cases are projected to reduce national electricity demand by roughly 5% by 2020, and I have uh, some graphical illustrations of a few of these things on the next few slides. The next slide, this shows a map, uh, the status of state ERSs as of the end of 2009, and this is from ACEEE. Uh, the one kind of caveat is the uh, state of Florida actually finalized its standard, so that will be turning blue any time on that map. Uh, so 23 states as of December 2009. Next slide. Uh, the next slide uh, are a couple of graphics from Matt Barbos that all studies from Lawrence Berkeley National Lab that profiled rate payer um, funded energy efficiency programs. The top figure is uh, on the spending side and it includes both electricity and natural gas programs and it shows uh, how those are expected to ramp up over the next um, 10 years. They have a, a couple of different cases. They have a low, a medium, and a high case. Uh, and the low and the medium cases are uh, roughly equivalent to projections based on existing state policy as of today. So those are the ones that I focused on when I referenced that 5% by 2020 number. And the lower figure is the incremental annual electricity savings from ratepayer-funded efficiency programs going forward that they're projecting uh, based on their assumptions. So that's based on uh, existing state policy. So next slide. Uh, like I said earlier, the state ERS designs vary by state across a number of different variables, including who establishes the target. In some states, they're uh, articulated in the authorized legislation. In other states, the state utility regulator is the one to determine the numerical target. Uh, they also differ across states by the size and the form of the targets. Some states just focus on electricity, whereas others include natural gas safety targets as well. Uh, and sometimes they're articulated uh, as a percentage of sales. That's usually the case, although there are a few states that uh, present to fit the uh, targets as a percentage of sales growth. Texas is an example of that. Uh, state ERS designs also vary by what is eligible to count for the targets. All states allow traditional energy efficiency programs that provide financial incentives and do education and technical assistance. Um, so that's common across the states, but there are other resources that kind of some states count, some don't, including uh, savings from combined heat and power projects, from improvements to the electric distribution system, and even some kinds of savings from mandatory codes and standards. And finally, evaluation, measurement, verification, which is how state determines whether or not the utility or other program administrator met their targets. The requirements for EMV vary across states as well. And I think we'll hear more about some of these issues from the state speakers in a minute. So with that, I'm going to move on to ERS at the federal level. Next slide. Um, a standalone federal ERS would essentially do a few things. Would place requirement on electric utilities to meet 
uh, savings targets by investing in energy efficiency. It would describe the types of efficiency investments that are eligible to count towards the ERF and the allowable methods for estimating savings from those programs. And it would also establish clear energy savings targets that can be utilized in utility state regional resource planning and forecasting. Um, there are a few standalone ERF proposals at the federal level, including HR 2529 from Chairman Markey in the House and S. 548 from Senator Schumer. Uh, however, committee passed federal proposals do not include ERS. For example, H.R. 2454, also known as Waxman Markey, and S. 1462 from Chairman Bingman in the Senate do not include a standalone ERS. However, they do include a renewable electricity standard where energy efficiency is eligible to meet a portion of the standard. And I'm going to walk through in a little bit more detail. Uh, those two bills and the efficiency kind of the efficiency focused elements of the renewable electricity standards from those two bills. Um, they're pretty similar in terms of the obligated entities. These are uh, both bills are electric utilities with annual sales greater than four million megawatt hours, um, but their target timetables differ a little bit. Um, in the House version, it starts at six percent in 2012 and ramps up to 20 percent in 2020 and beyond, and up those percentages, one quarter of the target can be met with energy efficiency, although the governor may increase that percentage to two-fifths. Um, on the Senate side, uh, the annual targets start at 3% in 2011 and ramp up to 15% in 2021, and 26.67% of the target can be met with energy efficiency upon petition by the governor. So those are the, the nominal targets, um, but they're the way you determine the amount of efficiency in renewables you need to procure is by taking that nominal target and multiplying it by the base amount, which is annual sales in a particular year, adjusted for a few of the things that you see in the next row. Um, you, uh, according to the bill, reduce that base amount by a few types of, of electric generation, including hydro that doesn't qualify for the renewable component, by generation from CCS, and from generation from new nuclear in the House bill. In the Senate bill, you also reduce it by generation from municipal solid waste and from improvements at existing nuclear plants. So that has the effect of reducing the amount of efficiency renewables that are needed to comply with the RES. Next slide. Um, in terms of the eligible energy efficiency resources, both bills include um, energy savings that happen at customer facilities, which are typically targeted by efficiency programs. Uh, they also include improvements to the distribution system and from combined heat and power projects. Uh, the eligible mechanisms are similar to kind of what states are doing to date. They require that the program administrators play a significant role in achieving the state. And both bills are uh, explicit about excluding savings from mandatory building codes and appliance standards from counting towards the target. Um, in terms of training for energy savings, the bills differ pretty significantly. In the House bill, there's a more narrow provision that allows for trading of energy savings occurring in the purchase, purchasing utility state and that meets the EMB requirement. And that trading can happen through bilateral contracts. Uh, in contrast, in the Senate, uh, it directs DOE to establish a federal efficiency credit trading program. Next slide. Uh, in terms of the EMV requirements, both direct the administering agency in the House bill to the FERC and in the Senate bill to DOE to, per, to prescribe standards and protocols for acceptable EMV methods. Um, and the House bill allows FERC to delegate states the authority to oversee this EMV, um, but the Senate bill is silent on that topic. Next slide. Um, in terms of state authority, both bills are explicit. They preserve state authority to adopt more aggressive standards, and they also explicitly require the federal regulator to facilitate coordination with the states. Uh, the bills differ in terms of which federal agency is overseeing the bill. In the House bill, it's FERC, and in the Senate, it's DOE. And finally, on the alternative compliance payment and the penalties, uh, they differ a little bit in their amount, $25 a megawatt hour. Uh, in the House, it's twenty-one dollars per megawatt hour in the Senate that the utilities can pay if they if they don't meet their targets. That's all. 
alternative way to demonstrate compliance. Um, and any revenues that are generated from alternative compliance payments are returned to the state for purposes of efficiency of compliance programs. So that is uh, a summary of the uh, two federal bills focused on the efficiency component of the RES. Um, this, these are some additional resources for more information um, at the federal and state level. And last slide is my contact information if you have further questions. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Jeff. We um, have about oh, just a little under 40 people on the phone, so please take uh, advantage of the opportunity to, to ask Jeff some questions uh, about his presentation before we move on to our next speaker. You, all you have to do is press pound six to unmute your line, and you can jump right in. Any qu clarifying questions? Jeff, what's the time frame on? Those bills. Um, well, so the House bill, uh, the Rocky Markey bill, was passed out of the House last year, um, and the the Senate bill has passed Chairman Bingaman's committee, which is the Energy and Natural Resources Committee, and has yet to go to the House floor. So that's the current status of the bills. We, uh, while you were talking, we had another request for the, um, the website where you can download the documents, um, including Jeff's presentation. That's www.epatechforum.org, and I sent it out via the chat line, too, so everybody should have it. Any other questions for Jeff? Well, thanks a lot for the overview. Um, I will uh, turn it over now to Mike Sherman. Let me give you a quick introduction. Um, Mike is the Director of Energy Efficiency Programs in Massachusetts in the Department of Energy Resource Division. And he, he has responsibility for uh, both the gas and electric side on the efficiency programs and, and planning and evaluation. Um, and he is, right now, he's, he's overseeing the effort to really increase the program expenditures and savings over the next three years goal is to get more than 2% of the electric load delivered in the form of energy efficiency. So Mike is going to tell you a little bit more detail about their energy efficiency resource standard and how it's implemented in Massachusetts. Are you ready to go, Mike? Uh, yeah, I'm ready. Are you hearing me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, who's driving here? Okay. Uh, are you seeing the uh, screen here? Yes, we can see your presentation. If you put it into slide view mode, well, it'll take up a little bit more, but uh, it's looking good. There you go. Thanks. Uh, so I want to start by saying that um, although we have a, a, an efficiency resource standard that was enacted in 2008, in fact, um, efficiency has been a significant resource um, for, for some time. And if you uh, look at the first slide, what that shows is the, the stack of, um, of different sources of supply um, against um, our total electric needs. And um, as you see, efficiency uh, sits there at the, uh, the fifth, fifth from the bottom there at about um, 8% or so in 2008. It's actually probably closer to 10 at this point. And that's a, that's a cumulative number um, which we trace back to um, to uh, improvements that have been made um, since um, 1991, as far back as we have records. The second, second slide shows the stream of, of savings um, that have come from the program uh, going back to that time, and, and also um, essentially the, the total of all of those uh, little colored bars and the blue area behind it is our total electricity need. So efficiency has been there. And um, yeah, it has been a significant uh, part of the uh, part of the picture in Massachusetts. And um, in 2008, we enacted uh, the thing called the uh, the Green Communities Act, uh, which basically um, is, a, is basically what we're going to talk about too, here too. Um, I also have a slide here, um, and this one dates back about six months, so it's possible it's a little bit out of date by now. Um, but 
was in, uh, from one of our consultants uh, describing um, in a little bit of summary detail what sorts of um, resource standards there are out there, uh, what the goals are, where there is a end date, um, how they're set up. And uh, Massachusetts, which is uh, third from the bottom of this one, uh, shows our standard is all achievable cost effective efficiency. And we're going to talk about um, how exactly, um, what that means and how we're going to get there. So um, here's our, um, here are our two uh, defining pieces of legislation. And uh, the important thing about the, the Green Communities Act is that uh, it's their requirement to uh, first acquire all available cost effective energy efficiency is less than the cost of supply. And, and that mandate um, is placed on both the electric and gas utilities. Um, and so that's um, what we have been doing. Our, our focus at many other states has been on electricity, but uh, the gas component is in, increasingly important. Um, additionally, um, also in 2008, the Global Warming Solutions Act uh, required reductions of 10 to 25 percent by 2020. The state is actually going to shortly announce what that 2020 goal is, and 80 percent by 2050. That's probably something that uh, many of you are familiar with, um, and uh, I think we're on a path towards actually working ourselves towards those goals. Um, where are we? Here we go. So here. A real question is, uh, is essentially, what does all cost-effective efficiency mean? Um, in, in some some states have um, actually um, created uh, an integrated resource planning process. Some have, um, as you've seen in the previous slides in Jeff Brown's uh, presentation, have talked about a very specific uh, goal by a particular date. Um, in our case, we had a, a more undefined um, sort of situation, which I think uh, actually helps us in terms of planning. Um, but we do have to have a regulatory finding by our, our utility commission um, back in the, the uh, three year plans that the electric and gas utilities are uh, presenting that uh, the fact that they have uh, made this, uh, this to uh, to reach that, uh, that, that goal of acquiring all efficient utilities, excuse me, all available. Um, and our, our, big, our big three here are natural gas, electric energy, and CHP. Um, we do um, look at electric demand. It's never been a primary focus, um, although it is important one. Also, in, uh, for some of you who may not know, in New England, uh, there is a forward capacity market, which also pays for demand reduction, and uh, the electric utility program participates in that. Um, Non-regulated fuels are Included, but uh, we have been serving residential customers uh, with uh, oil and protein, and we may have an experiment this year on the commercial industrial side um, if, uh, if the utility commission has particular initiative. Uh, so we're hoping to move toward an all fuel uh, regime in the very near future. And all right. Um, so we we have more resources than we had. We under uh, an electric utility restructuring law that was passed in 1997. Uh, they, we had a assistance benefit charge, which for the last several years was fixed at 125 million dollars a year on the electric side. Um, and uh, and also there was a uh, there was gas efficiency, which was done entirely through a settlement process, and um, and that through uh, three five-year plans and stayed fairly steady at $25 million. In 2009, we began ramping things up so that the, the total, total expenditures on the electric side went to $108 million and gas increased to $30 million. And those are going to increase further. Our expenditure goal through 2012 are $2.1 billion. And, um, and that should return us approximately uh, $4 billion in net uh, benefits throughout, the, uh, throughout that time. Uh, we've also had a decoupling order that, that was uh, instituted in 2008 um, to take away the disincentive to doing further efficiency for the utilities. And those decoupling proceedings have just, uh, just gotten into it. So one of the questions in all this 
is um, what we actually do to establish that we are um, that the utilities are seeking all cost effective efficiency. And um, what we decided to do, since um, neither the law or the regulations really told us, but through um, an energy efficiency advisory council, which was established by the 2008 law, and uh, we developed an assessment process. And um, so we had several months to do this entire planning operation. Um, we decided not to to do a uh, typical sort of technical potential study. Um, uh, partly there are a number of reasons for doing that. Our, our experience has been uh, the tech potential studies tend to be somewhat conservative. Uh, they tend to, uh, to miss or downplay technology changes and rates of diffusion of technology. They tend to focus on end use and, and specific technologies and really miss um, something that we think is critical moving forward, which are really whole facility approaches, meaning home set business and behavioral approaches as well, is really enlisting people to change what they do and how they do that. Uh, furthermore, in, in potential studies, the, the achievable part of the study, the, the 